A Song for St. Cecilia's Day, 1687, by John Dryden. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. A Song for St. Cecilia's Day, 1687. From harmony, from heavenly harmony, this universal frame began. When nature underneath a heap of jarring atoms lay, and could not heave her head, the tuneful voice was heard from high. Arise, ye more than dead. Then cold and hot, and moist and dry, in order to their stations leap, and music's power obey. From harmony, from heavenly harmony, this universal frame began. From harmony to harmony, through all the compass of the notes it ran, the diapason closing full in man. What passion cannot music raise and quell? When Jubal struck the corded shell, his listening brethren stood around, and wondering on their faces fell to worship that celestial sound. Less than a god they thought there could not dwell Within the hollow of that shell That spoke so sweetly and so well. What passion cannot music raise and quell? The trumpet's loud clangor Excites us to arms With shrill notes of anger and mortal alarms. The double, double, double beat of the thundering drum cries hark the foes come charge charge tis too late to retreat the soft complaining flute in dying notes discovers the woes of hopeless lovers whose dirge is whispered by the warbling lute sharp violins proclaim their jealous pangs and desperation fury Frantic indignation, depth of pains, and height of passion for the fair, disdainful dame. But, oh, what art can teach, what human voice can reach the sacred organ's praise? Notes inspiring holy love, notes that wing their heavenly ways to mend the choirs above. Orpheus could lead the savage race, and trees uprooted left their place, sequacious of the lyre. But bright Cecilia raised the wonder higher, when to her organ vocal breath was given, an angel heard, and straight appeared, mistaking earth for heaven. Grand Chorus As from the power of sacred lays the spheres began to move, and sung the great Creator's praise to all the blessed above. So when the last and dreadful hour this crumbling pageant shall devour, the trumpet shall be heard on high, the dead shall live, the living die, and music shall untune the sky. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Spell by Paul Verlaine Translated from the French by Gertrude Hall From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter The Spell Son joyeux important d'un clavecin sonneur, Petrus Borel. The keyboard, over which two slim hands float, shines vaguely in the twilight pink and grey, whilst with a sound like wings, note after note takes flight to form a pensive little lay that strays, discreet and charming, faint, remote, about the room, where perfumes of her stray. What is this sudden quiet cradling me To that dim ditty's dreamy rise and fall? What do you want with me, pale melody? 
what is it that you want ghost musical that fades toward the window waveringly a little open on the garden small end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Passions by William Collins From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Passions, an ode for music When music, heavenly made, was young, While yet in early Greece she sung, The passions oft, to hear her shell, Thronged around her magic cell. Exulting, trembling, raging fainting possessed beyond the muses painting by turns they felt the glowing mind disturbed delighted raised refined till once tis said when all were fired filled with fury rapt inspired from the supporting myrtles round they snatched her instruments of sound and as they oft had heard apart sweet lessons of her forceful art each for madness ruled the hour would prove his own expressive power first fear his hand its skill to try amid the chords bewildered laid and back recoiled he knew not why even at the sound himself had made next anger rushed his eyes on fire in lightnings owned his secret stings in one rude clash he struck the lyre and swept with hurried hand the strings with woeful measures won despair lo sullen sounds his grief beguiled a solemn strange and mingled air twas sad by fits by starts twas wild but thou o hope with eyes so fair what was thy delightful measure still it whispered promised pleasure and bade the lovely scenes at distance hail still would her touch the strain prolong and from the rocks the woods the vale she called on echo still through all the song and where her sweetest theme she chose a soft responsive voice was heard at every close and hope enchanted smiled and waved her golden hair and longer had she sung but with a frown revenge impatient rose he threw his blood-stained sword in thunder down and with a withering look the war-denouncing trumpet took and blew a blast so loud and dread where never prophetic sounds so full of woe and ever and anon he beat the doubling drum with furious heat and though sometimes each dreary pause between dejected pity at his side her soul subduing voice applied yet still he kept his wild unaltered mien while each strained ball of sight seemed bursting from his head thy numbers jealousy to naught were fixed sad proof of thy distressful state of differing themes the veering song was mixed and now it courted love now raving called on hate with eyes upraised as one inspired pale melancholy sate retired and from her wild sequestered seat in notes by distance made more sweet poured through the mellow horn her pensive soul and dashing soft from rocks around bubbling runnels joined the sound through glades and glooms the mingled measure stole or over some haunted stream with fond delay round an holy calm diffusing love of peace and lonely musing in hollow murmurs died away but oh how altered was its sprightlier tone when cheerfulness a nymph of healthiest hue her bow across her shoulder flung her buskins gemmed with morning dew blew an inspiring air that dale and thicket rung the hunter's call to fawn and dry it known the oak-crowned sisters and their chaste-eyed queen satyrs and sylvan boys were seen peeping from forth their alleys green brown exercise rejoiced to hear and sport leapt up and seized his beechen spear 
last came joy's ecstatic trial he with viny crown advancing first to the lively pipe his hand addressed but soon he saw the brisk awakening vile whose sweet entrancing voice he loved the best they would have thought who heard the strain they saw in tempest vale her native maids amidst the festal sounding shades to some unwearied minstrel dancing while as his flying fingers kissed the strings love framed with mirth a gay fantastic round loose were her tresses seen her zone unbound and he amidst his frolic play as if he would the charming air repay shook thousand odours from his dewy wings o oh, music sphere descended maid friend of pleasure wisdom's aid why goddess why to us denied layst thou thy ancient lyre aside as in that loved athenian bower you learned an all commanding power thy mimic soul o oh nymph endeared can well recall what then it heard where is thy native simple heart devote to virtue fancy art arise as in that elder time warm energetic chaste sublime thy wonders in that godlike age fill thy recording sister's page tis said and i believe the tale thy humblest reed could more prevail had more of strength diviner rage than all which charms this laggard age even all at once together found cecilia's mingled world of sound oh bid our vain endeavour cease revive the just designs of greece return in all thy simple state confirm the tales her sons relate end of poem this recording is in the public domain invocation from the davideus by abraham cowley from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for librivox dot org by craig franklin invocation awake awake my lyre and tell thy silent master's humble tale in sounds that may prevail sounds that gentle thoughts inspire though so exalted she and i so lowly be tell her such different notes make all thy harmony hark how the strings awake and though the moving hand approach not near themselves with awful fear a kind of numerous trembling make now all thy forces try now all thy charms apply revenge upon her ear the conquest of her eye weaklier thy virtue sure is useless here since thou art only found to cure but not to wound and she to wound but not to cure too weak too wilt thou prove my passion to remove physic to other ills thou'rt nourishment to love sleep sleep again my lear for thou canst never tell my humble tale in sounds that will prevail nor gentle thoughts in her inspire all thy vain mirth lay by bid thy strings silent lie sleep sleep again my lear and let thy master die end of poem this recording is in the public domain Alexander's Feast, or The Power of Music, by John Dryden. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter as the narrator. And Jason in Canada as the chorus. Alexander's Feast, or The Power of Music, an ode. It was at the royal feast for persia won by philip's warlike son aloft in awful state the godlike hero sate on his imperial throne his valiant peers were placed around their brows with roses and with myrtles bound so should desert and arms be crowned 
the lovely days by his side sate like a blooming eastern bride in flower of youth and beauty's pride happy 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 pair none but the brave none but the brave none but the brave deserves the fair happy 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 pair none but the brave none but the brave none but the brave deserves the fair timotheus placed on high amid the tuneful choir with flying fingers touched the lyre the trembling notes ascend the sky and heavenly joys inspire the song began from jove who left his blissful seats above such is the power of mighty love a dragon's fiery form belied the god sublime on radiant spires he rode when he to fair olympia pressed and while he sought her snowy breast then round her slender waist he curled and stamped an image of himself a sovereign of the world the listening crowd admire the lofty sound a present deity they shout around a present deity the vaulted roofs rebound with ravished ears the monarch hears assumes the god affects to nod and seems to shake the spheres with ravished ears the monarch hears assumes the god affects to nod and seems to shake the spheres the praise of bacchus then the sweet musician sung of bacchus ever fair and ever young the jolly god in triumph comes sound the trumpets beat the drums flushed with a purple grace he shows his honest face now give the hot boy's breath he comes he comes bacchus ever fair and young drinking joys did first ordain bacchus blessings are a treasure drinking is the soldier's pleasure rich the treasure sweet the pleasure sweet is pleasure after pain bacchus blessings are a treasure drinking is the soldier's pleasure rich the treasure sweet the pleasure sweet is pleasure after pain soothed with the sound the king grew vain fought all his battles over again and thrice he routed all his foes and thrice he slew the slain the master saw the madness rise his glowing cheeks his ardent eyes and while he heaven and earth defied changed his hand and checked his pride he chose a mournful muse soft pity to infuse he sung darius great and good by too severe a fate fallen 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 from his high estate and weltering in his blood deserted at his utmost need by those his former bounty fed on the bare earth exposed he lies with not a friend to close his eyes with downcast looks the joyless victor sate revolving in his altered soul the various turns of chance below and now and then a sigh he stole and tears began to flow revolving in his altered soul the various turns of chance below and now and then a sigh he stole and tears began to flow the mighty master smiled to see that love was in the next degree twas but a kindred sound to move for pity melts the mind to love softly sweet in lydian measures soon he soothed his soul to pleasures war he sung is toil and trouble honour but an empty bubble never ending still beginning fighting still and still destroying if the world be worth thy winning think oh think it worth enjoying lovely thais sits beside thee take the good the gods provide thee the many rend the skies with loud applause so love was crowned 
but music won the cause the prince unable to conceal his pain gazed on the fair who caused his care and sighed and looked sighed and looked sighed and looked and sighed again at length with love and wine at once oppressed the vanquished victor sunk upon her breast the prince unable to conceal his pain gazed on the fair who caused his care and sighed and looked sighed and looked sighed and looked and sighed again at length with love and wine at once oppressed the vanquished victor sunk upon her breast now strike the golden lyre again a louder yet and yet a louder strain break his bands of sleep asunder and rouse him like a rattling peal of thunder hark hark the horrid sound has raised up his head as awaked from the dead and amazed he stares around revenge revenge timotheus cries see the furies arise see the snakes that they rear how they hiss in their hair and the sparkles that flash from their eyes behold a ghastly band each a torch in his hand those are grecian ghosts that in battle were slain and unburied remain inglorious on the plain give the vengeance due to the valiant crew behold how they toss their torches on high how they point to the persian abodes and glittering temples of their hostile gods the princess applaud with a furious joy and the king seized a flambeau with zeal to destroy thais led the way to light him to his prey and like another helen fired another troy and the king seized a flambeau with zeal to destroy Thais led the way to light him to his prey and like another helen fired another troy thus long ago ere heaving bellows learned to blow while organs yet were mute timotheus to his breathing flute and sounding lyre could swell the soul to rage or kindle soft desire at last divine cecilia came inventress of the vocal frame the sweet enthusiast from her sacred store enlarged the former narrow bounds and added length to solemn sounds with nature's mother wit and arts unknown before let old timotheus yield the prize or both divide the crown he raised a mortal to the skies she drew an angel down at last divine cecilia came inventress of the vocal frame the sweet enthusiast from her sacred store enlarged the former narrow bounds and added length to solemn sounds with nature's mother wit and arts unknown before let old timotheus yield the prize or both divide the crown he raised a mortal to the skies she drew an angel down end of poem this recording is in the public domain Beethoven's Third Symphony by Richard Hovey From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org By Jason in Canada Beethoven's Third Symphony Passion and pain, the outcry of despair, The pang of the unattainable desire, And youth's delight in pleasures that expire, and sweet high dreamings of the good and fair clashing in swift soul storm through which no prayer uplifted stays the destined death stroke dire then through a mighty sorrowing as through fire the soul burnt pure yearns forth into the air of the dear earth and with the scent of flowers and song of birds assuaged takes heart again made cheerier with this drinking of god's wine 
and turns with healing to the world of men and high above a sweet strong angel towers and love makes life triumphant and divine richard hovey end of poem this recording is in the public domain pan in wall street by edmund clarence stedman from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter pan in wall street just where the treasury's marble front looks over wall street's mingled nations where jews and gentiles most are wont to throng for trade and last quotations where hour by hour the rates of gold outrival in the ears of people the quarter chimes serenely told from trinity's undaunted steeple even there i heard a strange wild strain sound high above the modern clamour above the cries of greed and gain the curbstone war the auction's hammer and swift on music's misty ways it led from all this strife for millions to ancient sweet do-nothing days among the curdle-robed sicilians and as it stilled the multitude and yet more joyous rose and shriller i saw the minstrel where he stood at ease against a doric pillar one hand a droning organ played the other held a pan's pipe fashioned like those of old to lips that made the reeds give out that strain impassioned twas pan himself had wandered here a strolling through this sordid city and piping to the civic ear the prelude of some pastoral ditty the demigod had crossed the seas from haunts of shepherd nymph and satyr and syracusan times to these far shores and twenty centuries later a ragged cap was on his head but hidden thus there was no doubting that all with crispy locks or spread his gnarled horns were somewhere sprouting his club feet cased in rusty shoes were crossed as on some frieze you see them and trousers patched of diverse hues concealed his crooked shanks beneath them he filled the quivering reeds with sound and o'er his mouth their changes shifted and with his goat's eyes looked around where'er the passing current drifted and soon as on trinacrian hills the nymphs and herdsmen ran to hear him even now the tradesmen from their tills with clerks and porters crowded near him the bulls and bears together drew from johnsey court and new street alley as erst if pastorals be true came beasts from every wooded valley the random passers stayed to list a boxer egon rough and merry a broadway daphnis on his tryst with neighs at the brooklyn ferry a one-eyed cyclops halted long in tattered cloak of army pattern and galatia joined the throng a blousy apple vending slattern while old selinus staggered out from some new-fangled lunch-house handy and bade the piper with a shout to strike up yankee doodle dandy a newsboy and a peanut girl like little fawns began to caper his hair was all in tangled curl her tawny legs were bare and taper and still the gathering larger grew and gave its pence and crowded nigher while i the shepherd minstrel blew his pipe and struck the gamut higher o oh, heart of nature beating still with throbs her vernal passion taught her even here is on the vine-clad hill or by the air in water new forms may fold the speech new lands arise within these ocean portals but music waves eternal wands enchantress of the souls of mortals so thought i but among us trod a man in blue with the legal baton and scoffed the vagrant demigod and pushed him from the step i sat on doubting i mused upon the cry great pan is dead 
and all the people went on their ways and clear and high the quarter sounded from the steeple end of poem this recording is in the public domain On an Intaglio Head of Minerva by Thomas Bailey Aldrich From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada On an Intaglio Head of Minerva Beneath the warrior's helm, behold the flowing tresses of the woman Minerva, palace, what you will a winsome creature, Greek or Roman. Minerva? No, tis some sly minx in cousin's helmet masquerading. If not, then wisdom was a dame for sonnets and for serenading. I thought the goddess cold, austere, not made for love's despairs and blisses. Did Pallas wear her hair like that? Was wisdom's mouth so shaped for kisses? the nightingale should be her bird and not the owl big-eyed and solemn how very fresh she looks and yet she's older far than trajan's column the magic hand that carved this face and set this vine-work round it running perhaps ere mighty phidias wrought had lost its subtle skill and cunning who was he was he glad or sad who knew to carve in such a fashion? Perchance he graved the dainty head For some brown girl that scorned his passion. Perchance in some still garden place Where neither fount nor tree to-day is, He flung the jewel at the feet of Phryn, Or perhaps t'was Laius. But he is dust, we may not know His happy or unhappy story, Nameless, and dead these centuries, his work outlives him, there's his glory. Both man and jewel lay in earth beneath a lava-buried city. The countless summers came and went, with neither haste, nor hate, nor pity. Years blotted out the man, but left the jewel fresh as any blossom, till some Visconti dug it up, to rise and fall on Mabel's bosom. O oh, nameless brother, see how time your gracious handiwork has guarded. See how your loving, patient art has come at last to be rewarded. Who would not suffer slights of men and pangs of hopeless passion also? To have his carven agate stone on such a bosom rise and fall so. Thomas Bailey Aldrich End of Poem this recording is in the public domain. The Artist by Arthur Grissom From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org By Sonia as the narrator And Lian Yao as the master The Artist He wrought with patience long and weary years upon his masterpiece entitled fate and dreamed sweet dreams the while his crust he ate and gave his work his soul his strength and tears his task complete at last he had no fears the world would not pronounce his genius great but poor unknown pray what could he create the mad world laughed and gave not praise but jeers impelled to ask wherein his work was wrong he sought despairing one whose art was dead but on whose brow were wreathed the bays of fame the master gazed upon the picture long it lacks one thing to make it great he said and signed the canvas with his own great name End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Painted Fan by Louise Chandler Moulton From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 
read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. A painted fan. Roses and butterflies snared on a fan. All that is left of summer gone by, of swift bright wings that flashed in the sun, and loveliest blossoms that bloomed to die. By what subtle spell did you lure them here? fixing a beauty that will not change roses whose petals never will fall bright swift wings that never will range had you owned but the skill to snare as well the swift-winged hours that came and went to prison the words that in music died and fixed with a spell the heart's content then had you been of magicians the chief and loved and lovers should bless your art if you could but have painted the soul of the thing not the rose alone but the rose's heart flown are those days with their winged delights as the odour is gone from the summer rose yet still whenever i wave my fan the soft south wind of memory blows End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On a Fan That Belonged to the Marquise de Pompadour Ballade by Austin Dobson From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter On a Fan That Belonged to the Marquise de Pompadour Ballade Chicken skin, delicate, white, painted by Carlo Venlu. Loves in a riot of light, roses and vaporous blue. Hark to the dainty frou frou. Picture above, if you can, eyes that could melt as the dew. This was the Pompadour's fan. See how they rise at the sight, thronging the Oeil de Boeuf through courtiers as butterflies bright beauties that fragonard drew talon rouge falaba q cardinal duke to a man eager to sigh or to sue this was the pompadour's fan ah but things more than polite hung on this toy voyez-vous matters of state and of might things that great ministers do Things that, maybe, overthrew those in whose brains they began. Here was the sign and the cue. This was the Pompadour's fan. Envoy. Where are the secrets that knew? Weavings of plot and of plan. But where is the Pompadour, too? This was the Pompadour's fan. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Heck and You by Bliss Carmen From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org By Sonia as the narrator Craig Franklin as God Thomas Peter as Hack Lian Yao as Hugh and Jason in Canada as the master workman. Heck and you. Heck and you were the sons of God in the earlier earth than now, one at his right hand, one at his left, to obey as he taught them how. And Heck was blind, and you was dumb, but both had the wild, wild heart, and God's calm will was their burning will and the gist of their toil was art they made the moon and the belted stars they set the sun to ride they loosed the girdle and veil of the sea the wind and the purple tide both flower and beast beneath their hands to beauty and speed outgrew the furious fumbling hand of heck and the glorying hand of hue then fire and clay they fashioned a man and painted him rosy brown and god himself blew hard in his eyes 
let them burn till they smoulder down and there said heck and da thought you we'll rest for our toil is done but nay the master workman said for your toil is just begun and ye who served me of old as god shall serve me anew as man till i compass the dream that is in my heart and perfect the vaster plan and still the craftsman over his craft in the vague white light of dawn with god's calm will for his burning will while the mounting day comes on yearning wind swift indolent wild toils with those shadowy two the faltering restless hand of heck and the tireless hand of you end of poem this recording is in the public domain the axe by isabella valancy crawford from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for LibriVox.org by craig franklin as the narrator thomas peter as max and sonia as the axe the axe from malcolm's katie high grew the snow beneath the low-hung sky and all was silent in the wilderness in trance of stillness nature heard her god rebuilding her spent fires and veiled her face while the great worker brooded o'er his work bite deep and wide o wax the tree what doth thy bold voice promise me i promise thee all joyous things that furnish forth the lives of kings for every silver ringing blow cities and palaces shall grow bite deep and wide o ax the tree tell wider prophecies to me when rust hath gnawed me deep and red a nation strong shall lift his head his crown the very heavens shall smite eons shall build him in his might bite deep and wide o ax the tree bright seer help on thy prophecy max smote the snow way tree and lightly laughed see friend he cried to one that looked and smiled my axe and i we do immortal tasks we build up nations this my axe and i end of poem this recording is in the public domain labor by francis sergeant osgood from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for librivox dot org by jason in canada as the narrator lian yao as the robin and craig franklin as the wild bee labor pause not to dream of the future before us pause not to weep the wild cares that come o'er us hark how creation's deep musical chorus unintermitting goes up into heaven never the ocean wave falters in flowing never the little seed stops in its growing more and more richly the rose heart keeps glowing till from its nourishing stem it is riven labor is worship the robin is singing labor is worship the wild bee is ringing listen that eloquent whisper upspringing speaks to thy soul from out nature's great heart from the dark cloud flows the life-giving shower from the rough sod blows the soft breathing flower from the small insect the rich coral bower only man in the plan shrinks from his part labor is life tis the still water faileth idleness ever despaireth bewaileth keep the watch wound for the dark rust assaileth flowers droop and die in the stillness of noon labor is glory the flying cloud lightens only the waving wing changes and brightens 
idle hearts only the dark future frightens play the sweet keys wouldst thou keep them in tune labor is rest from the sorrows that greet us rest from all petty vexations that meet us rest from sin promptings that ever entreat us rest from world sirens that lure us to ill work and pure slumbers shall wait on thy pillow work thou shalt ride over care's coming billow lie not down wearied neath woe's weeping willow work with a stout heart and a resolute will labor is health lo the husbandman reaping how through his veins goes the life current leaping how his strong arm in its stalwart pride sweeping true as a sunbeam the swift sickle guides labor is wealth in the sea the pearl groweth rich the queen's robe from the frail cocoon floweth from the fine acorn the strong forest bloweth temple and statue the marble block hides droop not though shame sin and anguish are round thee bravely fling off the cold chain that hath bound thee look to yon pure heaven smiling beyond thee rest not content in thy darkness a clod work for some good be it ever so slowly cherish some flower be it ever so lowly labor all labor is noble and holy let thy great deeds be thy prayer to thy god end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Song of the Lower Classes by Ernest Charles Jones From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin as the Peasants Lian Yao as the Miners Jason in Canada as the Masons Sonia as the Weavers And Thomas Peter as the Soldiers The Song of the Lower Classes we plough and sow we're so very very low that we delve in the dirty clay till we bless the plain with the golden grain and the veil with the fragrant hay our place we know we're so very low tis down at the landlord's feet we're not too low the bread to grow but too low the bread to eat down down we go we're so very very low to the hell of the deep sunk mines but we gather the proudest gems that glow when the crown of a despot shines and whenever he lacks upon our backs fresh loads he deigns to lay we're far too low to vote the tax but not too low to pay we're low we're low mere rabble we know but at our plastic power the mould at the lordling's feet will grow into palace and church and tower then prostrate fall in the rich man's hall and cringe at the rich man's door we're not too low to build the wall but too low to tread the floor we're low we're low we're very very low yet from our fingers glide the silken flow and the robes that glow round the limbs of the sons of pride and what we get and what we give we know and we know our share we're not too low the cloth to weave but too low the cloth to wear we're low we're low we're very very low and yet when the trumpets ring the thrust of a poor man's arm will go through the heart of the proudest king we're low we're low our place we know we're only the rank and file we're not too low to kill the foe but too low to touch the spoil end of poem this recording is in the public domain the man with the hoe by edwin markham from the world's best poetry volume six Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Man with the Hoe Written after seeing Millet's world-famous painting 
god made man in his own image in the image of god made he him genesis bowed by the weight of centuries he leans upon his hoe and gazes on the ground the emptiness of ages in his face and on his back the burden of the world who made him dead to rapture and despair a thing that grieves not and that never hopes stolid and stunned a brother to the ox who loosened and let down this brutal jaw whose was the hand that slanted back this brow whose breath blew out the light within this brain is this the thing the lord god made and gave to have dominion over sea and land to trace the stars and search the heavens for power to feel the passion of eternity is this the dream he dreamed who shaped the suns and marked their ways upon the ancient deep down all the stretch of hell to its last gulf there is no shape more terrible than this more tongued with censure of the world's blind greed more filled with signs and portents for the soul more fraught with menace to the universe what gulfs between him and the seraphim slave of the wheel of labor what to him are plato and the swing of pleiads what the long reaches of the peaks of song the rift of dawn the reddening of the rose through this dread shape the suffering ages look time's tragedy is in that aching stoop through this dread shape humanity betrayed plundered profaned and disinherited cries protest to the judges of the world a protest that is also prophecy o masters lords and rulers in all lands is this the handiwork you give to god this monstrous thing distorted and soul quenched how will you ever straighten up this shape touch it again with immortality give back the upward looking and the light rebuild in it the music and the dream make right the immemorial infamies perfidious wrongs immedicable woes o masters lords and rulers in all lands how will the future reckon with this man how answer his brute question in that hour when whirlwinds of rebellion shake the world how will it be with kingdoms and with kings with those who shaped him to the thing he is when this dumb terror shall reply to god after the silence of the centuries end of poem this recording is in the public domain the man with the hoe by john vance cheney from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin as the narrator and Sonia as nature. The man with the hoe, a reply. Let us a little permit nature to take her own way. She better understands her own affairs than we. Montaigne. Nature reads not our labels, great and small, except she one and all, who striving win and hold the vacant place, all are of royal race him there rough cast with rigid arm and limb the mother moulded him of his rude realm ruler and demigod lord of the rock and clod with nature is no better and no worse on this bared head no curse humbled it is and bowed so is he crowned whose kingdom is the ground diverse the burdens on the one stern road where bears each back its load varied the toil but neither high nor low with pen or sword or hoe he that has put out strength lo he is strong of him with spade or song nature but questions this one shall he stay she answers yea or nay well ill he digs he sings and he bides on or shudders and is gone strength shall we have the toiler strength and grace so fitted to his place 
as he leaned there on oak where sea winds blow our brother with the hoe no blot no monster no unsightly thing the soil's long lineaged king his changeless realm he knows it and commands erect enough he stands tall as his toil nor does he bow unblest labour he has and rest need was need is and need will ever be for him and such as he cast for the gap with gnarled arm and limb the mother moulded him long wrought and moulded him with mother's care before she set him there and i she gave him mindful of her own piece of the plant the stone yea since above his work he may not rise she makes the field his skies see she that bore him and meets out the lot he serves her vex him not to scorn the rock whence he was hewn the pit and what was digged from it lest he no more in native virtue stand the earth sword in his hand but follow sorry phantoms to and fro and let a kingdom go end of poem this recording is in the public domain corn law hymn by ebenezer elliot from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada Corn Law Hymn Lord, call thy pallid angel the tamer of the strong, and bid him whip with want and woe the champions of the wrong. O oh, say not thou to ruin's flood, up sluggard, why so slow? But alone let them groan, the lowest of the low and basely beg the bread they curse where millions curse them now no wake not thou the giant who drinks hot blood for wine and shouts unto the east and west in thunder tones like thine till the slow to move rush all at once an avalanche of men while he raves over waves that need no whirlwind then though slow to move moved all at once a sea a sea of men ebenezer elliot end of poem this recording is in the public domain for all that and all that by robert burns from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for librivox dot org by thomas peter for all that and all that is there for honest poverty why hangs his head and all that the coward slave we pass him by we dare be poor for all that for all that and all that our toils obscure and all that the rank is but the guinea stamp the man's a gold for all that but though unhamely fair we dine we're hard and grey and all that ye fools their silks and knaves their wine a man's a man for all that for all that and all that their tinsel show and all that the honest man though e'er say poor is king o men for all that you see yon burkey called a lord where struts and stairs and all that though hundreds worship at his word he's but a coup for all that for all that and all that his ribbon star and all that the man of independent mind he looks and laughs at all that a prince can make a belted knight a marquis duke and all that but an honest man's a boon his might good faith he mourn for that for all that and all that their dignities and all that the pith of sense and pride of worth are higher ranks than all that 
the let us pray that come it may as calm it will for all that that sense and worth o'er all the earth may bear the gree and all that for all that and all that it's coming yet for all that when man to man the world o'er shall brothers be for all that end of poem this recording is in the public domain the good time coming by charles mckay from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada. The Good Time Coming There's a good time coming, boys, a good time coming. We may not live to see the day, but earth shall glisten in the ray of the good time coming. Cannonballs may aid the truth, but thought's a weapon stronger. We'll win our battle by its aid. Wait a little longer. There's a good time coming, boys, a good time coming. The pen shall supersede the sword, and right, not might, shall be the Lord in the good time coming. Worth, not birth, shall rule mankind, and be acknowledged stronger. The proper impulse has been given, wait a little longer. There's a good time coming, boys, a good time coming. War in all men's eyes shall be a monster of inequity in the good time coming. Nations shall not quarrel then, to prove which is the stronger, nor slaughter men for glory's sake. Wait a little longer. There's a good time coming, boys, a good time coming. Hateful rivalries of creed shall not make their martyrs bleed in the good time coming. Religion shall be shorn of pride, and flourish all the stronger, and charity shall trim her lamp. Wait a little longer. There's a good time coming, boys, a good time coming, and a poor man's family shall not be his misery in the good time coming. Every child shall be a help to make his right arm stronger. The happier he, the more he has. Wait a little longer. There's a good time coming, boys, a good time coming. Little children shall not toil under or above the soil in the good time coming, but shall play in healthful fields till limbs and mind go stronger, and every one shall read and write, wait a little longer. There's a good time coming, boys, a good time coming. The people shall be temperate, and shall love instead of hate in the good time coming. They shall use and not abuse, and make all virtue stronger. The reformation has begun, wait a little longer. There's a good time coming, boys, a good time coming. Let us aid it all we can, every woman, every man, the good time coming. Smallest helps, if rightly given, make the impulse stronger. Twill be strong enough one day. Wait a little longer. Charles Mackay End of Poem This recording is in the public domain. The Lotus Eaters by Alfred Lord Tennyson from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Six, Fancy and Sentiment, Part Two, read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin as the narrator, Lian Yao as the first mariner, Sonia as the second mariner, Jason in Canada as the third mariner, and Thomas Peter as the fourth mariner. The Lotus Eaters, One, Courage, he said and pointed toward the land. This morning wave shall roll us shoreward soon. In the afternoon they came unto a land in which it seemed always afternoon. All round the coast the languid air did swoon, breathing like one that hath a weary dream. Full-faced above the valley stood the moon, and like a downward smoke the slender stream along the cliff to fall and pause, and fall did seem. Two a land of streams some like a downward smoke slow dropping veils of thinnest lawn did go and some through wavering lights and shadows broke 
rolling a slumbrous sheet of foam below they saw the gleaming river seaward now from the inner land far off three mountain tops three silent pinnacles of aged snow stood sunset flushed and dewed with showery drops up clone the shadowy pine above the woven copse three the charmed sunset lingered low adown in the red west through mounting clefts the dale was seen far inland and the yellow down bordered with palm and many a winding vale and meadow set with slender galingale a land where all things always seemed the same and round about the keel the faces pale dark faces pale against that rosy flame the milk-eyed melancholy lotus-eaters came for branches they bore of that enchanted stem laden with flower and fruit whereof they gave to each but whoso did receive of them and taste to him the gushing of the wave far far away did seem to mourn and rave on alien shores and if his fellow spake his voice was thin as voices from the grave and deep asleep he seemed yet all awake and music in his ears his beating heart did make five they set them down upon the yellow sand between the sun and moon upon the shore and sweet it was to dream of fatherland of child and wife and slave but evermore most weary seemed the sea weary the oar weary the wandering fields of barren foam then someone said we will return no more and all at once they sang our island home is far beyond the wave we will no longer roam Coric song one there is sweet music here that softer falls than petals from blown roses on the grass or night dews on still waters between walls of shadowy granite in a gleaming pass music that gentlier on the spirit lies than tired eyelids upon tired eyes music that brings sweet sleep down from the blissful skies here are cool mosses deep and through the moss the ivies creep and in the stream the long-leaved flowers weep and from the craggy ledge the poppy hangs in sleep two why are we weighed upon with heaviness and utterly consumed with sharp distress while all things else have rest from weariness all things have rest why should we toil alone we only toil who are the first of things and make perpetual moan still from one sorrow to another throne nor ever fold our wings and cease our wanderings nor steep our brows in slumber's holy balm nor hearken what the inner spirit sings there is no joy but calm why should we only toil the roof and crown of things three lo in the middle of the wood the folded leaf is wooed from out the bud with winds upon the branch and there grows green and broad and takes no care sun steeped at noon and in the moon nightly dew fed and turning yellow falls and floats adown the air lo sweetened with the summer light the full-juiced apple waxing over mellow drops in a silent autumn night all its allotted length of days the flower ripens in its place ripens and fades and falls and hath no toil fast rooted in the fruitful soil four hateful is the dark blue sky vaulted o'er the dark blue sea death is the end of life ah why should life all labour be let us alone time driveth onward fast and in a little while our lips are dumb let us alone what is it that will last all things are taken from us and become portions and parcels of the dreadful past let us alone 
what pleasure can we have to war with evil is there any peace in ever climbing up the climbing wave all things have rest and ripen toward the grave in silence ripen fall and cease give us long rest or death dark death of dreamful ease five how sweet it were hearing the downward stream with half-shut eyes ever to seem falling asleep in a half dream to dream and dream like yonder amber light which will not leave the myrrh-bush on the height to hear each other's whispered speech eating the lotus day by day to watch the crisping ripples on the beach and tender curving lines of creamy spray to lend our hearts and spirits wholly to the influence of mild-minded melancholy to muse and brood and live again in memory with those old faces of our infancy heaped over with a mound of grass two handfuls of white dust shot in an urn of brass six dear is the memory of our wedded lives and dear the last embraces of our wives and their warm tears but all hath suffered change for surely now our household hearths are cold our sons inherit us our looks are strange and we should come like ghosts to trouble joy or else the island princes overbold have eat our substance and the minstrel sings before them of the ten years war in troy and our great deeds as have forgotten things is there confusion in the little isle let what is broken so remain the gods are hard to reconcile tis hard to settle order once again there is confusion worse than death trouble on trouble pain on pain long labour unto aged breath sore task to hearts worn out with many wars and eyes grown dim with gazing on the pilot stars seven but propped on beds of amaranth and molly how sweet while warm airs lull us blowing lowly with half-dropped eyelids still beneath a heaven dark and holy to watch the long bright river drawing slowly his waters from the purple hill to hear the dewy echoes calling from cave to cave through the thick twined vine to hear the emerald-coloured water falling through many a woven acanthus wreath divine only to hear and see the far-off sparkling brine only to hear where sweet stretched out beneath the pine eight the lotus blooms below the barren peak the lotus blows by every winding creek all day the wind breathes low with mellower tone through every hollow cave and alley lone round and round the spicy downs the yellow lotus dust is blown we have had enough of action and of motion we roll to starboard roll to larboard when the surge was seething free where the wallowing monster spouted his foam fountains in the sea let us swear an oath and keep it with an equal mind in the hollow lotus land to live and lie reclined on the hills like gods together careless of mankind for they lie beside their nectar and the bolts are hurled far below them in the valleys and the clouds are lightly curled round their golden houses girdled with the gleaming world where they smile in secret looking over wasted lands blight and famine plague and earthquake roaring deeps and fiery sands clanging fights and flaming towns and sinking ships and praying hands but they smile they find a music centred in a doleful song steaming up a lamentation and an ancient tale of wrong like a tale of little meaning though the words are strong 
chanted from an ill-used race of men that cleave the soil sow the seed and reap the harvest with enduring toil storing yearly little dews of wheat and wine and oil till they perish and they suffer some tis whispered down in hell suffer endless anguish others in elysian valleys dwell resting weary limbs at last on beds of asphodel surely surely slumber is more sweet than toil the shore than labor in the deep mid-ocean wind and wave and oar o oh, rest ye brother mariners we will not wander more end of poem this recording is in the public domain delay by charlotte fisk bates from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for librivox .org by craig franklin delay i do affirm that thou hast saved the race as much as thou hast ever made it lose men of quick action may thy name abuse but the world's life and theirs attest thy grace an hour of thee doth sometimes turn the face of men and kingdoms bidding them refuse what chosen last it had been death to choose through thee alone they missed the fatal place how often dies the guileful thought or end when guileless eyes detain us on our way what sin and shame that hindrance may forfend which we so hate and storm against to-day what mighty evils over all impend averted graciously by kind delay end of poem this recording is in the public domain the happy heart from patient gristle act one scene one by thomas decker from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for librivox .org by thomas peter the happy heart from patient gristle act one scene one art thou poor yet hast thou golden slumbers o sweet content art thou rich yet is thy mind perplexed o punishment dost thou laugh to see how fools are vexed to add to golden numbers golden numbers o sweet content o sweet o sweet content work apace 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 honest labour bears a lovely face then hey nonny nonny hey nonny nonny canst drink the waters of the crisped spring o sweet content swimst thou in wealth yet sinkst in thine own tears o oh, punishment then he that patiently wants burden bears no burden bears but is a king a king o oh, sweet content o oh, sweet o oh, sweet content work apace 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 honest labour bears a lovely face then hey nonny nonny hey nonny nonny end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Cobbler and the Financier by Jean de La Fontaine, translated from the French by Eliza Wright, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Six, Fancy and Sentiment, Part Two, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada as the narrator, Thomas Peter as the financier, and Craig Franklin as the cobbler. The Cobbler and the Financier. A cobbler sang from morn till night. Twas sweet and marvellous to hear. His trills and quavers told the ear of more contentment and delight enjoyed by that laborious wight than e'er enjoyed the sages seven or any mortals short of heaven. His neighbour, on the other hand, with gold in plenty at command, but little sang and slumbered less, a financier of great success. If e'er he dozed at break of day, the cobbler's song drove sleep away. 
and much he wished that heaven had made sleep a commodity of trade in markets sold like food and drink so much an hour so much a wink at last our songster did he call to meet him in his princely hall said he now oh, honest gregory what may your yearly earnings be my yearly earnings faith good sir i never go at once so far the cheerful cobbler said and queerly scratched his head i never reckon in that way but cobble on from day to day content with daily bread indeed well gregory pray what may your earnings be per day why sometimes more and sometimes less the worst of all i must confess and but for which our gains would be a pretty sight indeed to see is that the days are made so many in which we cannot earn a penny the sorest ill the poor man feels they tread upon each other's heels those idle days of holy saints and though the year is shingled o'er the parson keeps a finding more with smile provoked by these complaints replied the lordly financier i'll give you better cause to sing these hundred pounds i hand you here will make you happy as a king go spend them with a frugal heed they'll long supply your every need the cobbler thought the silver more than he had ever dreamed before the mines for ages could produce or world with all its people's use he took it home and there did hide and with it laid his joy aside no more of song no more of sleep but cares suspicions in their stead and false alarms by fancy fed his eyes and ears their vigils keep and not a cat can tread the floor but seems a thief slipped through the door at last poor man up to the financier he ran then in his morning nap profound oh give me back my songs cried he and sleep that used so sweet to be and take the money every pound end of poem this recording is in the public domain Labour Done from Song of the Bell by J. C. Frederick von Schiller From the translation of Samuel Atkins Eliot From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin Labour Done Let us with care observe what from our strength yet weakness springs, For he respect can ne'er deserve, Who hands alone to labour brings. Tis only this which honours man, His mind with heavenly fire was warmed, That he with deepest thought might scan The work which his own hand has formed. Cheerful in the forest's gloom, The wanderer turns his weary steps, to his loved though lowly home, bleating flocks draw near the fold, and the herds, wide-horned and smooth, slow pacing come, lowing from the hill, the accustomed stall to fill, heavy rolls along the wagon, richly loaded, on the sheaves with gayest leaves, they form the wreath, and the youthful reapers dance upon the heath, street and mark it all a quiet, and round each domestic light gathers now a circle fond, while shuts the creaking city gate, darkness hovers o'er the earth, safely still each sleeper covers, as with light, that the deed of crime discovers, for wakes the law's protecting might. Holy order, rich with all, the gifts of heaven that best we call, freedom, peace, and equal laws of common good the happy cause she the savage man has taught what the arts of life have wrought changing the rude hut to comfort splendour and filled fierce hearts with feelings tender and yet a dearer bond she wove our home our country taught to love 
a thousand active hands combined for mutual aid with zealous heart in well apportioned labour find their power increasing with their art master and workman all agree under sweet freedom's holy care and each content in his degree warns every scorner to beware labour is the poor man's pride success by toil alone is won king's glory in possessions wide we glory in our work well done end of poem this recording is in the public domain Haste Not, Rest Not by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe Translated from German From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada Haste Not, Rest Not Ohne Hast, Ohne Rast Without haste, without rest Bind the motto to thy breast bear it with thee as a spell storm and sunshine guard it well heed not flowers that round thee bloom bear it onward to the tomb haste not let no thoughtless deed mar for i the spirit's seed ponder well and know the right onward then with all thy might haste not years can ne'er atone for one reckless action done rest not life is sweeping by go and dare before you die something mighty and sublime leave behind to conquer time glorious tis to live for i when these forms have passed away haste not rest not calmly wait meekly bear the storms of fate duty be thy polar guide do the right whate'er betide haste not rest not conflicts past god shall crown thy work at last from the german of johann wolfgang von goethe end of poem this recording is in the public domain work by henry van dyke from the world's best poetry volume six Fancy and Sentiment, Part Two. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. Work. Let me but do my work from day to day, in field or forest, at the desk or loom, in roaring market place or tranquil room. Let me but find it in my heart to say, when vagrant wishes beckon me astray, this is my work, my blessing, not my doom. Of all who live, I am the one by whom this work can best be done in the right way. Then shall I see it not too great nor small to suit my spirit and to prove my powers. Then shall I cheerful greet the labouring hours and cheerful turn when the long shadows fall at eventide to play and love and rest, because I know for me my work is best. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Wish by Abraham Cowley From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada A Wish This only grant me that my means may lie too low for envy, for contempt too high some honour i would have not from great deeds but good alone the unknown are better than ill-known rumour can ope the grave acquaintance i would have but went depends not on the number but on the choice of friends books should not business entertain the light and sleep as undisturbed as death the night my house a cottage more than palace and should fitting be for all my use, no luxury. My garden painted o'er with nature's hand, not arts, and pleasures yield, Horace might envy in his saving field. 
Thus would I double my life's fading space, For he that runs it well twice runs his race. And in this true delight, these unbought sports, This happy state, I would not fear, nor wish my fate, But boldly say each night, Tomorrow let my son his beams display, Or in clouds hide them, I have lived today. Abraham Cowley End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Contentment by Joshua Sylvester From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Contentment I weigh not fortune's frown or smile, I joy not much in earthly joys, I seek not state, I reck not style, I am not fond of fancy's toys, I rest so pleased with what I have, I wish no more, no more I crave. I quake not at the thunder's crack, I tremble not at news of war, I swound not at the news of wreck, I shrink not at the blazing star, I fear not loss, I hope not gain, I envy none, I none disdain. I see ambition never pleased, I see some tantals starved in store, I see gold's dropsy seldom eased, I see even Midas gape for more. I neither want nor yet abound, Enough's a feast, content is crowned. I feign not friendship where I hate, I fawn not on the great in show. I prize, I praise a mean estate, Neither too lofty nor too low. This, this is all my choice, my cheer, A mind content, a conscience clear. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Content from Farewell to Folly, 1617, by Robert Greene. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Content from Farewell to Folly, 1617 sweet are the thoughts that savour of content the quiet mind is richer than a crown sweet are the nights in careless slumber spent the poor estate scorns fortune's angry frown such sweet content such minds such sleep such bliss beggars enjoy when princes oft do miss the homely house that harbors quiet rest, The cottage that affords no pride or care, The mean that grease with country music best, The sweet consort of mirth and music's fair, Obscured life sets down a type of bliss, A mind content, both crown and kingdom is. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Song by John Bunyan From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada Song He that is down need fear no fall, He that is low no pride, he that is humble ever shall have God to be his guide. I am content with what I have, little be it or much, and, Lord, contentment still I crave, because thou savest such. Fullness to such a burden is that I go on pilgrimage. Here little and hereafter bliss is best from age to age. John Bunyan End of Poem this recording is in the public domain. In Prison by Sir Roger Lestrange From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 
Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. In Prison Beat on proud billows, boreas blow, Swell curled waves high on Jove's roof, Your incivility doth show That innocence is tempest-proof. Though surely near as frown my thoughts are calm, Then strike affliction, for thy wounds are balm. That which the world miscalls a jail, A private closet is to me, Whilst a good conscience is my bail, And innocence my liberty. Locks, bars, and solitude together met, Make me no prisoner but an anchoret. I, whilst I wished to be retired, Into this private room was turned, As if their wisdoms had conspired, The salamander should be burned. Or like those sophists that would drown a fish, I am constrained to suffer what I wish. The cynic loves his poverty, the pelican her wilderness, and tis the Indian's pride to be naked on frozen Caucasus. Contentment cannot smart, Stoics we see, make torments easier to their apathy. These manacles upon my arms I as my mistress favours wear, and for to keep my ankles warm I have some iron shackles there these walls are but my garrison this cell which men call jail doth prove my citadel i'm in the cabinet locked up like some high-prized marguerite or like the great mogul or pope am cloistered up from public sight retiredness is a piece of majesty and thus proud sultan i'm as good as thee end of recording End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Cleon and I by Charles Mackay From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada Cleon and I Cleon hath a million acres, ne'er a one have I. Cleon dwelleth in a palace, in a cottage I. Cleon hath a dozen fortunes, not a penny I. Yet the poorer of the twain is Cleon, and not I. Cleon true possesseth acres, but the landscape I. Half the charms to me it yieldeth money cannot buy. Cleon harbors sloth and dullness, freshening vigor I. He in velvet, I in fustian, richer man am I. Cleon is a slave to grandeur, free as thought am I. Cleon fees a score of doctors, need of none have I. Wealth surrounded, care environed, Cleon fears to die. Death may come, He'll find me readier, happier man am I. Cleon sees no charms in nature, in a daisy I. Cleon hears no anthems ringing in the sea and sky. Nature sings to me forever, earnest listener I. State for state, with all attendance, who would change? Not I. Charles Mackay End of Poem this recording is in the public domain. The Wants of Man by John Quincy Adams From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter The Wants of Man Man wants but little here below, Nor wants that little long. Tis not with me exactly so, but tis so in the song. My wants are many, and, if told, would muster many a score. And were each wish a mint of gold, I still should long for more. What first I want is daily bread, and canvas backs, and wine, and all the realms of nature spread before me when I dine. 
four courses scarcely can provide my appetite to quell with four choice cooks from france beside to dress my dinner well what next i want at princely cost is elegant attire black sable furs for winter's frost and silks for summer's fire and cashmere shawls and brussels lace my bosom's front to deck and diamond rings my hands to grace and rubies for my neck i want who does not want a wife affectionate and fair to solace all the woes of life and all his joys to share of temper sweet of yielding will a firm yet placid mind with all my faults to love me still with sentiment refined and as time's car incessant runs and fortune fills my store i want of daughters and of sons from eight to half a score i want alas can mortal dare such bliss on earth to crave that all the girls be chaste and fair the boys all wise and brave i want a warm and faithful friend to cheer the adverse hour who ne'er to flatter will descend nor bend the knee to power a friend to chide me when i'm wrong my inmost soul to see and that my friendship prove as strong for him as his for me i want the seals of power in place the ensigns of command charged by the people's unbought grace to rule my native land nor crown nor sceptre would i ask but from my country's will by day by night to ply the task her cup of bliss to fill i want the voice of honest praise to follow me behind and to be thought in future days the friend of humankind that after ages as they rise exulting may proclaim in choral union to the skies their blessings on my name these are the wants of mortal man i cannot want them long for life itself is but a span and earthly bliss a song my last great want absorbing all is when beneath the sod and summoned to my final call the mercy of my god end of poem this recording is in the public domain Contentment by Oliver Wendell Holmes From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Contentment Man wants but little here below Little, I ask, my wants of you I only wish a hut of stone A very plain brown stone will do That I may call my own and close at hand is such a one in yonder street that fronts the sun plain food is quite enough for me three courses are as good as ten if nature can subsist on three thank heaven for three amen i always thought cold victual nice my choice would be vanilla ice i care not much for gold or land give me a mortgage here and there some good bank stock some note of hand or trifling railroad share i only ask that fortune send a little more than i shall spend honours are silly toys i know and titles are but empty names i would perhaps be plenipo but only near st james i'm very sure i should not care to fill our governator's chair jewels are baubles tis a sin to care for such unfruitful things one good-sized diamond in a pin some not so large in rings a ruby and a pearl or so will do for me i laugh at show my dame should dress in cheap attire good heavy silks are never dear i own perhaps i might desire some shawls of true cashmere some marrowy crepes of china silk like wrinkled skins on scalded milk i would not have the horse i drive so fast that folks must stop and stare an easy gait two forty-five suits me i do not care 
perhaps for just a single spurt some seconds less would do no hurt of pictures i should like to own titians and raffles three or four i love so much their style and tone one turner and no more a landscape foreground golden dirt the sunshine painted with a squirt of books but few some fifty score for daily use and bound for wear the rest upon an upper floor some little luxury there of red morocco's gilded gleam and vellum rich as country cream busts cameos gems such things as these which others often show for pride i value for their power to please and selfish churls deride one stradivarius i confess two meerschaums i would fain possess wealth wasteful tricks i will not learn nor ape the glittering upstart fool shall not carved tables serve my turn but all must be of bool give grasping pomp its double share i ask but one recumbent chair thus humble let me live and die nor long for midas golden touch if heaven more generous gifts deny i shall not miss them much too grateful for the blessing lent of simple tastes and mind content end of poem this recording is in the public domain Ulysses by Alfred Lord Tennyson From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Ulysses It little profits that an idle king By this still hearth among these barren crags Matched with an aged wife I meet and dole unequal laws unto a savage race that hoard and sleep and feed and know not me. I cannot rest from travel. I will drink life to the lees. All times I have enjoyed greatly, have suffered greatly, both with those that loved me and alone. On shore, and when through scudding drifts the rainy Hyades vex the dim sea, I am become a name, for always roaming with a hungry heart, much have I seen and known, cities of men and manners, climates, councils, governments, myself not least, but honoured of them all, and drunk delight of battle with my peers, far on the ringing plains of windy troy i am a part of all that i have met yet all experience is an arch where through gleams that untravelled world whose margin fades forever and forever when i move how dull it is to pause to make an end to rust unburnished not to shine in use as though to breathe were life life piled on life for all too little and of one to me little remains but every hour is saved from that eternal silence something more a bringer of new things and vile it were for some three sons to store and hoard myself and this gray spirit yearning in desire to follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bound of human thought this is my son mine own telemachus to whom i leave the sceptre and the isle well loved of me discerning to fulfil this labour by slow prudence to make mild a rugged people and through soft degrees subdue them to the useful and the good most blameless is he centred in the sphere of common duties decent not to fail in offices of tenderness and pay meet adoration to my household gods when i am gone he works his work i mine there lies the port the vessel puffs her sail there gloom the dark broad seas my mariners souls that have toiled and wrought and thought with me 
that ever with a frolic welcome took the thunder and the sunshine and opposed free hearts free foreheads you and i are old old age hath yet his honour and his toil death closes all but something ere the end some work of noble note may yet be done not unbecoming men that strove with gods the lights begin to twinkle from the rocks the long day wanes the slow moon climbs the deep moans round with many voices come my friends tis not too late to seek a newer world push off and sitting well in order smite the sounding furrows for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars until i die it may be that the gulfs will wash us down it may be we shall touch the happy isles and see the great achilles whom we knew though much is taken much abides and though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven that which we are we are one equal temper of heroic hearts made weak by time and fate but strong in will to strive to seek to find and not to yield end of poem this recording is in the public domain to all in haven by philip bork marston from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for LibriVox.org by craig franklin to all in haven all ye who have gained the haven of safe days and rest at ease your wanderings being done except the last inevitable one be well content i say and hear men's praise yet in the quiet of your sheltered bays blend waters shining in on equal sun forget not that the awful storm tides run in far unsheltered and tempestuous ways remember near what rocks and through what shoals worn desperate mariners strain with all their might they may not come to your sweet restful goals your waters placid in the level light their graves wait in that sea no moon controls that is in dreadful fellowship with night end of poem this recording is in the public domain a woman's wish by mary ashley townsend from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for librivox dot org by leanne yao a woman's wish would i were lying in a field of clover of clover cool and soft and soft and sweet with dusky clouds on deep skies hanging over and scented silence at my head and feet just for one hour to slip the leash of worry in eager haste from thought's impatient neck and watch it coursing in its heedless hurry disdaining wisdom's call or duty's beck oh it were sweet where clover clumps are meeting and daisies hiding so to hide and rest no sound except my own heart's steady beating rocking itself to sleep within my breast just to lie there filled with the deeper breathing that comes of listening to a wild bird's song our souls require at times this full unsheathing all swords will rust if scabbard kept too long and i am tired so tired of rigid duty so tired of all my tired hands find to do i yearn i faint for some of life's free beauty its loose beads with no straight string running through i laugh if laugh you will at my crude speech but women sometimes die of such greed die for the small joys held beyond their reach and the assurance they have all they need end of poem this recording is in the public domain
the world and the quietist by matthew arnold from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for librivox dot org by sonia as the narrator and jason in canada as critias the world and the quietist why when the world's great mind hath finally inclined why you say critias be debating still why with these mournful rhymes learned in more languid climes blame our activity who with such passionate will are what we mean to be critias long since i know for fate decreed it so long since the world hath set its heart to live long since with credulous zeal it turns life's mighty wheel still doth for laborers send who still their labor give and still expects an end yet as the wheel flies round with no ungrateful sound do adverse voices fall on the world's ear deafened by his own stir the rugged laborer caught not till then a sense so glowing and so near of his omnipotence so when the feast grew loud in susa's palace proud a white-robed slave stole to the great king's side he spake the great king heard felt the slow rolling word swell his attentive soul breathed deeply as it died and drained his mighty bowl End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Rest by Margaret L. Woods From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Rest To spend the long warm days silent beside the silent stealing streams to see not gaze to hear not listen thoughts exchanged for dreams see clouds that slowly pass trailing their shadows o'er the far faint down and ripening grass while yet the meadows wear their starry crown to hear the breezes sigh cool in the silver leaves like falling rain pause and go by tired wanderers o'er the solitary plain see far from all affright shy river creatures play hour after hour and night by night low in the west the white moon's folding flower thus lost to human things to blend at last with nature and to hear what songs she sings low to herself when there is no one near end of poem this recording is in the public domain invocation to sleep by john fletcher from the world's best poetry volume six Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao. Invocation to Sleep from Valentinian. Come, sleep, and with thy sweet deceiving, lock me in delight a while. Let some pleasing dreams beguile all my fancies, that from thence I may feel an influence, all my powers of care bereaving. Though but a shadow, but a sliding, let me know some little joy. We that suffer long annoy are contented with a thought, through an idle fancy wrought. Oh, let my joys have some abiding. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sleep by Dr. John Walcott From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao. Sleep. Come, gentle sleep, attend thy votary's prayer, and, though death's image to my couch repair, 
how sweet though lifeless yet with life to lie and without dying oh how sweet to die end of poem this recording is in the public domain